one go. Uh, well, thank you everybody for attending uh, today's webinar. My name is Robert Bale. I'm Vice President of Sales here at Genia. With me is Mike McSteny, who's our uh, Director of Operations on the Access Control side. Uh, today's topic is decoding access control lingo, access control in the complex lingo. So um, it's it's kind of a, uh, some of it's a basics of access control 101, um, as well as some deeper dive into credentialing, um, how users work, and then obviously we're gonna go through some of the product um, the reason we thought this was an important uh, topic as we've been uh, selling access control, introducing it to a lot of our clients, you know, we've learned that a lot of people aren't really familiar with the kind of deeper nuances of access control. How does a door physically work? Uh, what are all the parts of a system to make it active? So when we're scoping a project, uh, there's all these questions that come up and we thought it'd be a useful exercise just to kind of walk through the nuances of kind of the back end of how access control physically works so that you have a deeper understanding of what it is that we're doing when we come on site and we do an implementation. So, so that's the whole reason behind it. We'll talk about mobile a little bit, of course. And then, of course, uh, you know, as a last opportunity, we'll take you just through a brief walk of the platform. For those of you who haven't been in, uh, seen a demo or has, it's been a while since you've been inside, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to take a look at some of the things that are new. So. Uh, so once again, uh, I'm Robert Vale, Vice President of Sales here at Genia. Mike McSenny is our Head of Access Control. Um, so Mike is the co-founder, one of the co-founders of the Access Control uh, company that we acquired in 2019. So uh, so Mike now leads, our, leads that division for us. He helps on uh, obviously product uh, installations, uh, and service, kind of everything we know. So, so for those of you who are going to see Mike turning his head every once in a while, um, you know, we're trying to get a little bit back to normal here. So Mike is actually on the road. Uh, so one of the very first trips that we're taking, Mike is out there on the road helping with an installation. So he's now doing this live from the airport. So you hear some funny noises. Uh, for those of you, it's been a while since you've been in an airport. There's a lot of announcements that happen. So, uh, so as Mike's going, just bear with him as, as we go through this process. So, uh, so thank you. Um, so for those of you not familiar with Genia, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background on us. We're a software company based in Southern California. These are the companies that we work with on a, on a national and international basis. So uh, we work with a ton of customers on the commercial real estate side, so such as Naveen, Lincoln Property Company, Shorenstein, and then as well as we service the enterprise. So um, we have companies like Sumo Logic and Sunrun and Pendo. Uh, we handle all their locations um, uh, globally with, with, with our solution. Uh, one of the couple of our products, um, you know, we take pride in the direct service and support model. Uh, so it's kind of key to our business is, is having a really great support model. So we have a 98% customer, uh, 90 customer retention and we have a 75 net promoter score. So what that means is, you know, the customers who work with us, um, they trust our brand, um, they recommend us to, to their colleagues. And we take a lot of pride into that and it's a white glove approach when it comes to serving. Uh, so for those of you who've worked with us for a number of years, you know, you know, we're we're going to uh, trust that you that you believe that, and that this is what we've done to build our business over the over the years. So, uh, we have three main solutions. So, uh, for those of you who who aren't familiar overall with the Genia brand, uh, the way we got our start was really selling a product to the commercial real estate industry to manage overtime HVAC requests and billings in multi-tenant office properties. So, I'm a tenant in a building. It's late. I need air conditioning. I can pull up the Genia app requests the air, it turns it on, turns it off, and does all the billing at the end of the month. That then success there led us to a second, develop a second product uh, for submeter reading and billing. So in once again, multi-tenant office buildings, shopping centers, airports, zoos, uh, there are submeters that are installed to track excessive energy uh, consumption and to build that back. So we created a software application to help streamline that collection and billing process launched that about 60, uh, six years ago. Um, and then we've grown from zero to over 23,000 meters a month uh, that we're reading and billing on a, on a national basis. And then in 2019, like I mentioned, we came across Mike and uh, his co-founder, Mashit Patel. Uh, we're very intrigued by their product offering and very cloud-based access control solution um, and uh, made, a, made, a, made a nice um, offer to them and uh, brought them onto the Genia family. So it's now being rebranded as Genia Access Control. Uh, so we have now uh, three, uh, three different lines of product. Uh, but today's focus, of course, is gonna be on access control. Uh, and then Mike's our in-house industry expert uh, when it comes to all things access control related. So, so we'll get started. So today's agenda, um, so 
basic anatomy of an access control system. So it's a little bit of an access control 101, but it's really important to set the stage of, you know, what is it that we do as a business and why is our system uh, so important to, uh, to your facilities. We'll also talk about proprietary versus non-proprietary uh, in terms of hardware and software. You know, why is it important? We, we get asked a lot of questions um, as we do demonstrations with customers and prospects uh, all over the world. You know, is your system proprietary? What's the difference between proprietary and non-proprietary? Why is this so important? What does it mean for me in terms of an expense or uh, to implement a new system and get it serviced uh, and to make any changes? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about cre uh, credential security and what does it mean? So between uh, prox cards, um, Bluetooth, NFC, utilizing your phone, uh, there's a lot of different ways to enter a site and it's like, how do, you, how do we handle all this? And what should you be looking at in terms of security as well? And then, of course, how can we help? So, we'll, you know, obviously, I'm a salesperson. I can't help myself. Uh, we'll do a little bit about uh, obviously our products and how can we help you uh, in terms of uh, your facilities and your physical security. So let's start with the anatomy of access control. So Mike, um, so once again, this is a little bit of access control 101, but maybe you can just kind of give a, just a high level overview of like kind of the basic components of, of, of access control, like looking at doors and controllers and interface, like, like what are we seeing here? You're yeah, muted. thanks Rob. So the, I break it down into three main component, sets of components, right? You've got the door side components, You've got the head end components, and then you've got the sort of software database level uh, side of things. So starting at the door, right? That's the, the thing that everyone knows. Um, this is, you have your reader, you've got the lock on the door that can come in usually one of two flavors. You've got a mag lock um, that is constantly powered and holding the door shut. Then the other is a door strike uh, and those door strikes require power to release, and then the door will open. You've also got uh, a door release button. So whenever you have a mag lock, you need to have a physical override. So in the case of an emergency, you can hit a button and go out the door. It doesn't require any power or any software to let you out. Uh, so think of things like a fire. Uh, so the last thing is the door position switch. So how do we know if a door is open or closed? That is where the DPS comes in. Uh, and it's just a little magnet that will tell you whether or not the, uh, the door is open or closed. And then under certain circumstances, that's what a, a triggers an alarm, saying that the door is forced open or that the door is held open for too long and needs to be closed. Um, so those are your door side pieces of equipment. Then you have the what's called the head end location, right? So there's a cable that, or cables that run from the door to the head end. I'm going to mute for a second. All right. So at the head end, excuse me, everybody. Uh, travel schedule's got a little bungled, so uh, that helps them in the airport. Uh, so when you get to the head end side of the, the system, you've got basically three main components. You or, Well, four, really. You've got the control. You've got the enclosure that everything sits in. Then you've got the master controller so, or the main controller, right? This is what connects to the database via the cloud or on a local network. Uh, and then you've got the interface panel. So the interface panel is really where the door equipment connects to the access control system. Uh, and the interface just passes the data back and forth between the controller and the database and the door. So it reads the cards. Send, sends that to the controller, gets a decision from the controller, and then opens the door. And then, of course, you've got power supplies, right? You need to provide power for the reader, the lock, all that stuff. So those are your main head-end components. Uh, that, and, and right there is where most of that, the difference between non-proprietary and proprietary hardware comes in. That's what we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and then, of course, last awesome. but not least, is that database. So yeah. you've got database and software side. Uh, it's all run on a server. Now that server can be in a network closet in your building or your office, or it could be in a data center in, you know, in an Amazon warehouse somewhere. Um, that's the difference between on-prem and cloud. Awesome, Mike, thank you, thank you. That's very, uh, very helpful. Uh, yeah, and we'll get a little bit into the database and exactly how that works here in, in another slide. So, um, so when you go into the, you know, like look at controller, right, there's the, uh, there's the controllers, there's the interface and the readers. So, um, you know, 
maybe just talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what each one does very specifically. Um, you know, why do you need a certain amount of interfaces um, per reader, you know, to interact with readers? Um, and then, of course, you know, why, are, why do we have Mercury and HID? What's the importance of both Mercury and HID? Sure. So uh, starting top to bottom with controllers. So uh, whenever you go into an access control software product and you add a user, right, give them a key card, uh, that all has to get stored locally on a controller. So um, that if the network goes offline for any reason, that when you badge in, the door still works, recognizes who you are and opens the door. Um, so really the controller is that local replication of your server's database. Uh, it has all the keys, all the settings, and it's also recording the events that are happening and then syncing that to the server. Uh, so that's, the, that's why the controller is really the brain of the system on site. Then you have interfaces, uh, so you have the middleman. These are, these are p things that just pass data back and forth and execute commands. Uh, so the reason that most systems have two doors or All right, <laughs> and I'm back. Uh, someone forgot their child. So <laughs> uh, with the interface, right, the, the most, most manufacturers make them so that they can support two doors. Uh, there are instances with like AMAG where you can have four eight door interface panels, but for the most part uh, with, with Mercury panels, HID Vertex panels, each interface is two doors per interface. Uh, and some of the controllers can actually have an interface built into them. So it's not just a local database controller. It's also a controller and an interface in one. So think of like the Mercury LB1502, 4502. That's the database controller as well as it has support for two doors because it's got an interface built into it. So this is just what's passing the data and, and opening and closing the doors. Last but not least, the reader, right? This is the... This is the uh, the thing that everyone interacts with to get in and out of a door for the most part. Um, so readers have a few different flavors to them. The, va the vast majority out there are simple card readers. Uh, a few years ago, people started to introduce readers that had support for Bluetooth, which means that you can open a door with your phone. Uh, then other readers will have keypads on them. So Keypads can be used as a, as a single form of authentication where you just enter a PIN code and it'll open the door. Or you can use it as a two-factor authentication device and you badge in, enter a PIN code, and then release the door. Uh, and then last but not least, biometrics, right? So biometrics come in, in a few different flavors. Most commonly is fingerprint scanners, but you could have facial recognition scanners. Um, you can have palm readers. So there's a few different types of biometric readers, but the core concept is the same. It's just translating whatever biometric that you're pre presenting to the reader into a, a credential number that's stored in the controller database locally. Um, so when you s scan your palm, it goes, well, that's Mike, and his key card number for that palm is one, two, three, four, five. So go ahead and open the door because he has access to that. Uh, so that's the, it's, it's all sort of on the back end working the same way. Got it, got it. That's very helpful, Mike. Thank you. So, and then for those of you here, you know, uh, Genia, we're, we're built upon non-proprietary hardware. We'll talk a little bit about what that means a uh, second, but that, what that means at a very high level is uh, we both support Mercury as well as HID. Uh, so those are our partners in terms of the hardware side uh, when it comes to the interfaces and controllers as well as the readers. Uh, but that is definitely a, a you know, Genia, Genia way of, uh, of how our product has been built. Um, Moving on, when we talk a little bit about the kind of database and software. So this goes obviously beyond, you know, just uh, the hardware, but going to the next level of this is, you know, you know, when you have an access control system, there's a software component of access control and it can be on-prem or it can be cloud-based, but you know, what's the overall purpose of it? How does it work? How does it communicate back to the controllers? Like, especially like us being a cloud-based solution, 
how do we communicate back to the uh, the head end, the master controller, so that it does its job appropriately? It knows uh, it knows all the commands and all the users. Sure. So, uh, with a with a cloud based server, it's connected to local controllers over a TCP IP connection, so the internet, right? Um, and the the, the, I guess the core benefit of having a cloud-based system is that uh, it enables a few things that an on-prem system can't, like multiple uh, multiple administrators with not paying additional licenses. So oftentimes with legacy access control systems where you have on-prem client machines, you're having to pay an exorbitant fee per client machine uh, for access to the software. With cloud, you can just set up a user, give them a login, and then they're in, and they can manage it whenever they want. So we have customers that have hundreds of administrators in their system, um, and that's only possible because the system is cloud-based. They don't have to create a client machine for every single administrator. Um, so that's a huge benefit of the cloud. Everywhere. 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 With, uh, with an on-prem system, right, the the database, uh, the, the server for that, and that's hosting the access control software is local. So uh, there's usually one or two computers in a basement or an IT closet somewhere, and you can only add or remove users from that computer. The other problem with on-prem is that it doesn't easily integrate with anything else beyond just the access control system. So let's say you have Azure Active Directory as your, as your IT system of record for your company. With an on-prem system, you really it's really hard to integrate. It's not impossible, there are ways to do it, but it's very difficult to set up an on-prem server to talk to a cloud server. So um, it requires a lot of pro custom programming, uh, usually other pieces of software to have to get involved. So on-prem is pretty limited. Um, there are some applications that require it though. Um, so yeah. those are the two main differences. Makes Makes sense. So, so one of the common questions we get during the sales process, because you know, obviously we're a cloud-based solution, is what happens if internet goes down? Yeah, that's one of the big things. So, um, so Mike, maybe you can kind of address yeah. that, right? Like, you know, what what happens in that instance? Sure. So um, we talked about this a little bit on the last slide, but if we remember that the the controller is sort of the brains on uh, on premises for a cloud-based access control system. Well, when, when, when that internet connection breaks, uh, then all of the settings are stored locally, right? Every key, all their access permissions are on that local controller or set of controllers, or you can have more than one in that on in, in the system at a given site. Um, and so when the network connection goes down, it'll, it'll still be fully operational uh, in terms of, you know, if the user comes up, scans their badge, scans their phone, scans their fingerprint, it'll still open the door if they have the right permissions. Now, um, what's also happening is that that controller is going to record those events, right? So every time it grants access to a user, it's going to say, all right, I gave Rob access to the server room. And then when the connection's restored, it will sync that data to the cloud server, right? So you will, the only things you wouldn't be able to do while the system is offline is see those events in real time, add or remove a user, or remotely unlock the door. But the core function of the access control system is still working. Uh, and all that's and all those events are still have are stored locally and being recorded in real time. Um, you just wouldn't be able to see them until the network connections were stored. Got it. Got it. Super helpful. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, oh, one other thing that has come up. What about if there's just a power outage in the building? Like you know, you're in a building or wherever it's at, your office, and there's just no power. What's kind of the default settings of basically any access control system? What does it default to if there's a power outage? So it default, defaults to a locked state. So uh, the doors will be locked if you don't have adequate battery backup for the system. Uh, we always recommend that our customers install a UPS or uh, a system of batteries to, uh, to support the system if the, the power for the building or the office is down. Uh, at least you have 12 to 24 hours of battery life, depending on how big your UPS is and just other factors, like what kind of locks, things like that. Um, so if you're on the fence, just spend the extra 500 bucks because there's going to be a day that you're going to wish you did. So uh, we always recommend that you spec it in to your system. Awesome. Awesome. Super helpful. Thanks, Mike. 
Uh, as we continue on, when you look at like just some of the common uses of an access control system and, uh, you know, and, and I'll just kind of go through these ones uh, real quick, Mike, you know, some very basic level, right, is adding and removing users from the and keys from the database. Like, you know, that's just kind of very basic. So when you look at access control, it's like updating the controller settings, sending alerts from a controller to a user. So what does that mean is if, um, you know, if something is offline, what kind of alerts can you get? If there's a door held open event, if there's a type of alarming, you want to just generally display system activity. People want to know when are grants happening. We were just on a call with the customer. I want to be able to see all the people who are in and when they when they came into the building. I want to get an arrival report. I want to make it really easy. I want to update all the cord for, card formats uh, in the controller, and the access control system can help all of that. Uh, if you're looking to do anti-passback alerts, um, you know what time, what area, when do all these events particularly happen? And of course, the elevator and door monitoring. Can I, um, you know, I want to know when elevators are interacting, when there's swipes for the elevators, if I've locked, locked floors. Uh, how do we track all that? And that's really, you know, at a very basic level, the software portion of access control can help manage all of that as well. Um, got a question, uh, Mike? If you don't have battery backup or batteries run out. Electromagnetic, electromagnetic locks would default to open and secure, uh, not locked in detail. No. And that is correct. So, uh, so thanks, Mike, for jumping in. Yeah, just I'm trying to give detailed responses. I'm also trying not to bombard you with like announcements from the report. Yeah, no, appreciate that, Mike. So, um, as we continue on, let's talk about now proprietary versus non-proprietary hardware. This comes up all the time. Um, you know, between our sales organization and from just customers who want to understand the differences between the, you know, between the systems. So let's start with proprietary hardware. So um, Mike, maybe we can talk about just, you know, what, in general, what is, you know, what would be considered proprietary? Maybe talk about some companies that we know of that are proprietary and, you know, just what's unique about that. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, you know, I guess in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of confusion around this point. Um, and, Part of my job is to is to help customers understand the difference uh, when we're talking when we're talking to them directly. And so, I guess the, the 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 most basic definition I can give for proprietary versus non proprietary system is where the hardware and the software will only talk to each other. You're in a primary uh, you're in a pri proprietary hardware situation, right? If, if the master controller on site will only talk to the software. Uh, from the, the company that provided both, then it's proprietary. Uh, an open protocol system means that the, the hardware on site can talk to multiple different software providers depending on, um, uh, depending on a few factors. But for instance, we're a Mercury-based system. So uh, Mercury is a hardware manufacturer. They provide an SDK to companies like us. Um, that can build their application on top of their SDK. So what this means for the customer is that if you have Mercury hardware, you have a choice between three dozen software providers out there, uh, or more really, uh, that work on their hardware. Whereas if you have proprietary hardware, you can only use that one software provider's software and hardware together. Um, so you're kind of stuck if you ever want to change. You, you need to rip and replace all that. So that's sort of the... The bet that we all make on ourselves in the Mercury ecosystem is that our system is so good and our customer support is so good that the customer will be satisfied and not switch. But they always have the ability to in, in a pretty easy and uh, painless way. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and then when we look at you know non-proprietary, obviously our system is built on non-proprietary, which is a is a huge, uh, in our opinion, advantage to our system. Uh, so let's talk about like you know. Obviously, why did we build that? What does it mean for the customer when we come to do a software takeover? What are some of the bigger benefits of being on non-proprietary? And what does it mean as us as a software provider too? Sure, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword, really, uh, but the, the sword only cuts both ways for us. For the customer, it's good. Uh, and so what, what it really means is, it, let's say you have uh, an older Linnell system at your building or your office. So that's a Mercury-based system, very popular one. Um, what we can do is we can come in and take over those existing Mercury panels by switching the firmware and the OEM code on that panel, and then it'll talk to our software. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly easy process uh, to do. Not super easy, I won't say that, but it, it's fairly easy, and it doesn't require you to switch all your hardware, which can be really expensive and time-consuming. 
Um, so that's the primary benefit for the customers that they can upgrade their old access control system to a new cloud-based one with a lot all the different features that we provide uh, without ripping and replacing all that hardware. Now the flip side is true where um, the customer also is not locked into us as a software provider, right? If you have a new access control system, you could theoretically switch to any other Mercury-based system. Not sure why you would, but you can. Um, so that's that's sort of the, the double-sided benefit for the customer. Um, now that's obviously a risk for us, but it just keeps us honest. Yep, yep, and that's you know that 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 keeps us on the edge as a developer, as a software developer, continuing to enhance the product. Also means that we have to be really good at service. And uh, you know, we talked about in the very beginning, we have a white glove approach when it comes to service. Um, and that what this this keeps us on our toes is this ebb and flow with the customers uh, is to know that we have to continue to develop, enhance the product. And otherwise, we can potentially be replaced if we don't provide good service. So it's a big deal. I also I also I like that point about the scale. Uh, because this often is a question for our enterprise customers, uh, or from our enterprise customers. But why, why should I really care beyond just having the ability to switch away from you? Why is it better for me to go with outside Jay Harder? Think about it this way. If you're opening an office in Singapore or in Sydney, Australia or London, right? It's, it's better to be on a, a hardware platform that integrators and technicians around the world know how to operate with. It'll keep your cost down, it'll eliminate errors in the field, and ultimately lead to a, a more scalable system globally. So we have customers that have offices with us in three or four different continents, and we don't have to worry about, you know, those local technicians not understanding how the hardware works or needs to be wired up, right? They've worked with Mercury systems for their entire career, so we're just another Mercury system and they get to install the same hardware and then we handle the software programming on the back end. Uh, but it makes those installs nice and smooth. It makes supporting the hardware really easily on a global basis. So yeah, that, that's just another key benefit to being on a non proprietary hardware system. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Mike. So as we move on, uh, you know, we've talked about you know basics of an access control system. Got through the software portion of it. Um, we went briefly through the different hardware components. Talked about the difference between proprietary and non-proprietary, and you know where we fall into. Um, and then the next thing you know we want to go through is also talking about credentials. Uh, we get asked a lot about this uh, during the sales process. Is you know what kind of credentials? One, you know, what are the different credentials? What does Genia support? Uh, do we have to switch everything out if we implement your system? Um, you know, so maybe just talk about a little bit of the, kind of the different types of credentials. Uh, and, and most, you know, most people on this call, you're familiar with these, but let me just a little bit of nuances. There. And then, of course, how do we interact with the different types of credentials uh, with our customers as well? Yeah. So this is, you know, a credential. A credential really is just a number that identifies a human being at its core. And that credential can be um, delivered in a number of different mediums and then languages. So the med think of the medium as sort of the, uh, like the way you're saying it. So you can say it over Bluetooth, which would be a phone, right? Your, your phone speaks over Bluetooth to the reader, or it can speak over NFC, which is a 13 and a half megahertz radio, radio wave, right? These are just different radio signals. Um, so that's how a phone would communicate. Now, a card can communicate in a, a lot of different ways. Um, the most common is Prox, which is a very you know, basic uh, uh, low-frequency low radio wave. And that's activated by a, a, a little magnetic field within the reader. So when you, when you bring the card within the field, it activates the chip on the card, and then the, the, the chip sends the credential number to the reader. Um, so, so that's really like what's happening there is, is that these credentials are being presented in different mediums to a reader. Then you can encrypt that number in a number of different languages. Um, so there's HID has a couple of proprietary ones like CIOS um, that is a proprietary language that communicates that number over. Um, there's MyFair and Desfire, which are high you know, high security formats 
but they're non-proprietary. So a lot of different card and reader manufacturers will use MyFair or Desfire protocol to communicate from reader to credential or vice versa. Um, so the last thing is, uh, is biometrics, right? So a biometric is associated with a credential number. It's just a different medium for presenting that number. So if, if anyone on this call is familiar with enrolling people in a biometric system, you basically take a scan of the face or the finger, and then you assign, uh, either the biometric software will assign a credential number to that, or you assign a number to that biometric. Um, but the core concept is the same. When you present that credential medium to the reader, it will then represent a graphic credential number and that's grant you access if you have the proper permissions. Um, so those are some of the different mediums that you represent credentials to readers in an access control environment. Gotcha, gotcha. And and of course, you know, the the you know, our system is built to support all these forms of credentials. So whether you have existing prox cards or FOBs or you want to use mobile, you know, sometimes with mobile there's an upgrade requirement for the readers. Uh, but we can support all forms of credentials uh, with our system. Uh, so it's a very, very flexible system, which is which is uh, one of the huge benefits to our customers. Um, so when we talk about mobile, uh, you know, Mike, maybe we can just talk about, you know, how did we decide to build our app? What improvements did we make? How is the interaction with HID or Rego? Sure. So um, we, from day one, back in 2015, when HID was just releasing HID Mobile, it wasn't even called Arigo back then. Uh, they they give us an SDK and an API to interact with their system. So the SDK is really what tells our mobile app how to communicate with their readers. And then you have this API that allows us to generate key card numbers, assign them to a user, and then update that in your database automatically. Some, some companies will leave that 100% on the HID side. You want to use HID Mobile, you get an Arigo login, you have to create the keys in that system, you have to update your database manually. With our system, it's all we've all, we fully integrated it. In fact, if I didn't tell, so, you know, if we didn't tell our customers that you were using HID Mobile on the back end, they wouldn't have any idea um, because you just log into our platform, you hit, you know, send a new key to a user, we'll generate that key number, send them an invite, they download our app, the key lives in our app, uh, and voila, you're off to the races. It's a one-click provisioning process. So it's so much more convenient. Uh, it's so convenient, in fact, most people don't even recognize that it's a different product that's wrapped inside of ours. Um, that's huge, right? And then the second is from day one, right? So back in the early days, HI used to charge per key for these keys. Um, and we never wanted that our users to have to think about, you know, when I'm adding a mobile key to someone's profile, that I have to pay 20 bucks. Um, that, that should never be the thought process. It should be, I just need to get this person to pay, so let me do it for So we, we took away the paper key, we went out a deal with HID, uh, made it so that it's just part of the subscription for our customers. Uh, and then of course we added a lot of extra protection around that. So SSO, right, common term in access control now. Uh, but SSO is, is actually something that comes to us from the IT world. SSO means single sign-on. So for those of you that have a corporate job, you're probably familiar with single sign-on systems where you just log in with your email and a single password, and it'll give you access to your, to your email client or your CRM software or your marketing software, right? Same concept here for your access to your office. If you're going to use a key on your phone. We want that to live within your SSO walled garden so you don't have to have a separate login to get the key activated on your phone and all that. So it makes it a lot easier for the, the corporate customer and it's more secure. So that's a, that was kind of a win-win situation. That point. Awesome, Mike. Uh, yeah, the uh, the mobile credential, it, it's becoming more and more prevalent um, for all the entire customer base, uh, especially as we get to kind of a, you know, return to work environment, uh, the ability to utilize your phone uh, to get into the facility, into the parking deck is becoming a bigger deal. And uh, you know we are we're, we're helping to lead the charge in terms of utilizing mobile and rolling out mobile uh, to the customer base. So, um, so let's just talk real quick about just you know our general software. So we talked about you know the basics of access control, the hardware, the credentialing, the the software component, like what does it actually mean? And now let's kind of walk through our system. So 
our system is a, as Mike said, it's a 100% cloud-based access control system. So we took everything that you're accustomed to in enterprise access control, and we built it into the cloud. And by doing that, that allows us to improve upon a lot of things. One is the uh, user provisioning portion. We can help streamline that entire process of getting users in and out of the system, not only for just one location, but across your entire enterprise globally. Uh, so if you're an IT manager or a facility manager and you're managing all physical access, I can assign Mike to our office in Atlanta, our office in Michigan, as well as our office in India uh, in a matter of seconds. It just takes really, really a couple of clicks and I can add him to all those locations uh, and give him a key and he can use his phone to get into there. Um, because it's also cloud-based, it's, it's built up, you know, open API uh, architecture allows us to also allow for integrations. So we have integrations with video providers, uh, visitor management systems. We also have our own native visitor management system that interacts with the access control product. Um, and of course, I can remotely manage physical security, meaning from my phone, I can remotely lock and unlock doors. I can add users. I can do anything from my phone or from the web portal as well and manage multiple sites at the same time. Uh, and then Junia, uh, we have a direct service and support model. So 24 seven support, uh, anytime somebody needs help, they can have live chat with us. Uh, there's an 866 number you can call. If you have a software issue, you can talk to the software manufacturer directly and get some help. Uh, that's really key to our business is having that direct interaction with the end user. So it helps us, you know, just make sure you're taken care of, but also from a product development standpoint, we get the best ideas of product enhancements from the customers. So anytime we can learn more about better ways to utilize it, we can put it into production relatively quickly because uh, we're a nimble company when it comes to that. Uh, in terms of credentials, we already talked about that, but we support all forms of credentials. So if you've got existing key cards that are in place and they're also your physical badge because you have to walk around with it, we can put those in the system and support those existing formats. We can support clickers and fobs, and of course we can roll out mobile like we already talked about. So you give the, the we run the gamut of everything we do. So while the world may be telling us, hey, everybody wants to use their phone for everything, we, we know for a fact that some of those other physical credentials, the badges and the key cards are never going to go away. It's just part of part of the environment. There's a lot of people who aren't ready to move to their phone. Uh, could it be security reasons? Sometimes uh, corporate phones don't allow for apps. Uh, there's a variety of reasons that the uh, mobile is not just going to replace everything. Um, so, you know, we work in those confines of bringing in all the different uh, all the different forms of credentials. And then we've, you know, we're continuing to roll out uh, product enhancements. So, you know, so one thing that we've been tasked with uh, by our customers is to, you know, they want to be able to roll out safety and capacity uh, protocols. So because of the environment and the hybrid work environment, that's going to continue to, uh, you know, roll out to the, uh, to the world over the next, uh, you know, at least 12 months, if not longer. Uh, we wanted to really put some features in place in the access control system to help support that. So in a matter of about six weeks, we developed and launched a feature set called Safe Workplace. And what it does is it allows for essentially the HR managers, facility managers, IT directors to help um, you know, screen employees before they come on site, uh, allow for capacity planning, and to really track everything that's happening uh, from an employee aspect. So at a very high level, if uh, every day uh, when I leave the office, my credential is deactivated. When I want to come back to the office the next day or in two days, because I'm on a every other day schedule, I actually have to register to come in before my credential is reactivated. And right now, it's a customizable questionnaire. Right now, they're all related to COVID. Um, you know, am I feeling any symptoms of sick? You know, there's some organizations that require that you take a test every two weeks. Uh, am I waiting for test results? Have I been in contact with anybody in the last 14 days? When you answer appropriately, uh, then you're going to be approved. Now, there could also be capacity limits. So they may say, well, normally there's 100 people who work in this office, but right now we're only allowing for 50 people to be in the office at any given point in time. So if you're number 51, unfortunately, we're not going to activate your key unless there's a compelling reason. And that causes a conversation between uh, the employee and somebody from HR for IT or facilities to have that conversation. Okay, we're going to go over because of these particular reasons why, but it's documented. The other unique thing about Safe Workplace is it allows us also to have capacity, um, contact tracing. So in the instance that somebody does test positive within your organization, uh, I can pull into the access control system, look at that person. I can see every per other person who is in at that same day. Uh, so you have the ability to quickly kind of go through, identify who may be potentially at risk, and you can uh, reach out to those employees to let them know, hey, uh, so-and-so tested positive. 
Uh, so it's, it's a great enhancement. Once again, we did this in conjunction with one of our customers as a way to really prepare uh, for the uh, for, for reoccupying the office space. We also helped to uh, not only get the employees back, but we also wanted to help bring visitors on site. Uh, so the, you know, one of the big things we've asked is, been asked is, can you um, create a way for visitors to come on site in a touchless environment? So the first thing we looked at is, all right, we had a lightweight visitor management product that was really built for iPads. And you go in and you touch the iPad and, and register that you're coming on site. Well, you know, nobody wants to have these common devices that everybody touches. So we said, let's let's enhance this within the web application. Let's have a pre-registration process. So if I'm going to invite somebody on on into the building, I'm going to go ahead and pre-register them. So uh, so Kim Marchbank is going to come visit me on this date. Uh, I can send a pre-registration form out to Kim where she has to go through a series of questions before she's allowed to come on site. Now, those questions could be obviously COVID-related. It's very similar to Safe Workplace where you know, are you, have you been exposed to anybody? Are you taking a test? I may require that you sign a non-disclosure agreement or a waiver before you come on site. And then we said, why don't we go a step further uh, than just uh, you know a pre-registration form? Let's also require that they take a picture. So you actually have to go through and upload a selfie or upload a picture of yourself. Uh, so then we have documentation and we said, can we go even further? It's a native visitor management system to interact with the access control system. Uh, can we give them a QR code that actually does something, meaning does it unlock a door? And yes, we can. So we took it another step uh, further and we provide now QR codes that you can download to your Apple wallet or to uh, your or your Android wallet. Uh, and when you come on site, depending on where that QR code reader is physically located, I can remote, I can come in, use that as a physical temporary badge, unlock a reader, unlock a door, a turnstile, or even an elevator and get all the way through the site. Uh, without having to go to a security desk where I fill out a form um, and and go through that process. Now, there are some people who just want the pre-registration. They don't want to in, invest in the QR code, which is fine. Uh, we can still utilize that. It, the QR code is an optional feature of it, um, but it's very, very powerful to be able to say, okay, you can get somebody in from, from parking deck to elevators all the way to the suite. If a visitor comes in, they're pre-registered, and you have a very convenient way to do it in a, in a very safe environment. As we look at, you know, you know, continuing to enhance the product, we've also developed a uh, watch list uh, for both employees as well as for visitors. Um, so as people come in on site, you know, we, we wanted to, to give the heads of security a tool where they can say, okay, this is a pushy salesperson. Um, we want to make sure that we know before they come on site, before they do anything. Or you have a disgruntled em uh, employee or former employee that you want to put them on a watch list so that anytime they come on site, somebody is alerted to that uh, from a security aspect. And, and so that was asked uh, on a global basis to be able to put in watch list or block list. You know, we, we want to make sure somebody is not allowed to physically come on site. Uh, so that is, be, that is rolled out into the system as well. Uh, by the end of this month, you also see a global dashboard. The ability to manage the entire enterprise from one dashboard. So I can pull up, I can see all my locations, what's currently happening, how many employees do we have on site, uh, what's happening in terms of uh, all the uh, other alarms on a global basis. So it's kind of a, a light, very light GSOC. Um, it just allows you to see all the activity and everything's happening across the entire enterprise. Or if you're a commercial real estate owner and operator across the uh, portfolio of buildings, uh, allows you to see, okay, how many people are physically in our buildings? And if you're trying to figure out, okay, how do we get more property managers there, more engineering staff, more cleaning staff, it's going to give you that viewpoint from uh, from one dashboard. Uh, but it's very, very powerful. That is coming out at the end of the month. Uh, there'll be a big press release as well as email notifications. Of course, we can do live demos uh, once that feature is, uh, feature set is turned on. That is uh, that's coming in the very near future. In addition to that, uh, we're bringing uh, badge printing. We've been asked by a number of customers to be able to integrate with various badge pr uh, printing solutions. So we'll start with first the HID Fargo badge printing integration. That's going to be launched in July. We're in the process of creating digital badges. So as more and more people are trying to utilize their phone and you know not print things, not have to you know um, you know have you know things that are printed and on site with somebody because everybody has their phone. You may forget a badge, but you're never going to forget your phone. We wanted to create um, digital badges in a whole design studio so you can actually customize how the look and feel of those badges. I have different colors uh, for different levels of, uh, of employment with somebody. Um, we're also launching emergency plans. And so 
So say there is an active shooter situation. So this, this has been asked by us to, once again, enhance this service. So say there's an, an active shooter situation in a site and you want to push that person through a certain thoroughfare to either lock them in a location or, or push them out of the site. Uh, you can actually create all these different scenarios and with all the you know, different card readers, it'll either lock or unlock or push people through a certain thoroughfare. Um, so we already had emergency lockdown, emergency hold open, where it locks everything down or holds everything open. Now we're going a step further and you know, allow you to customize that based upon scenario. Um, and you'll be able to do this across the entire enterprise. Um, and then the last thing that's coming out is multilingual questionnaire. So uh, as Mike indicated, you know, right now we're in 18 different countries. Um, as we continue to enhance the product, we've been asked to be able to have questionnaires, especially for visitors coming on site in multiple languages. Um, you know, when you do New York, you know, buildings in New York or sites in New York, you get people from all over the world. We want to be able to uh, appease that and have the ability to have customized questionnaires in different languages uh, so that I can pick, okay, I you know, speak English or Spanish, whatever it may be, and fill out the appropriate questionnaire. So, so all that is coming soon here on our product roadmap. So you know, one of the things you'll see here at Jamea is that we're continuing to enhance the product on a regular basis and offer new product sets and feature sets. So uh, and with that, that's the end of the presentation. We're here almost at the top of the hour. Uh, you know, once again, I want to say thank you very much for everybody who attended today. Mike, thank you. I know you're traveling, and um, but we really appreciate you, uh, you know, jumping on and uh, and a chance to walk us through some of the basics. For those of you who are interested in, you know, learning more about, you know, our product in particular, or you'd like to see a live demonstration and talk very specifically about your locations. Uh, please reach out to us. We can go ahead and set up a one-on-one -on -one demonstration. You can reach out to myself. I'll direct you to the appropriate person on the sales team. You can also contact sales at getchania.com, fill out one of the forms on our website. Um, but we are here and available to really walk you through our system. So there's there's a lot that you can do. We only touched at a very, very high level of what we can do today, but the uh, the, the, the software is, is very, very flexible, and, and there's a lot of incredible things you can do with it. So, um, so with that, I want to say... Once again, thank you everybody who participated. Uh, this recording will go out um, later on today. So, Great, thanks Mike, for thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care.